Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hearts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. All right. So we're in a series called Back to the Basics. We're talking about some doctrinal truths. We're talking about some in-depth studies of what churches, what Christianity believes. And I want to start with a really big question. How many theologians do I have in the room today? All right, we're getting it. We're getting it. A theologian is anyone who has ever read the Bible. If you've ever read the Bible, you're a theologian. The word theology is two words, theos and logos, meaning the study of God or speaking to God or God speaking. So if God has ever spoke to you through the Bible, you are a theologian. Because you're a theologian, then we should study the Bible that way and look at things a little bit deeper. I am unfortunately a professional at this topic, okay? Um, I don't know that there's anybody who could be more of a professional than me at this topic. And today's topic is the doctrine of sin, the doctrine of sin. So yes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to let you all down, uh, but I have some experience with messing up. I have some experience with falling short of the glory of God. Anybody else in here ever, you know, just had, okay, all right. I was feeling judged for a second. <laughs> I was feeling bad. All right. The doctrine of sin. And I think for us to understand the doctrine of sin, we can't start at the beginning of the story because we won't fully understand. And we can't start at the end of the story. We have to start right in the middle of the story. Right? So today, as we study this out, we're going to start right in the middle of God's story of humanity with the most popular verse in the entire Bible. Can anybody tell me what that is, the most popular verse? John 3.16. You've seen it at football games and basketball games and under people's eyes on, you know, football. John 3.16. And if you don't know what it says, let's, let's look at this real quick. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, his only son. Now, many churches just stop there. But I think just as powerful as John 3.16 is John 3.17, and it says this, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Now, ain't that something? Because doggone if I haven't felt condemned by some churches. For God did not send Jesus into the world to condemn the world, but ready, watch, but in order that the world might be saved through him. That kind of changes things. It changes his approach to us. And then I think verse 18 is just as powerful. 318, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe in him is condemned already. All right, I'm going to draw back to this later on. They're condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. This is the middle of the story. This is the middle of the story. And because this is the middle of the story, it makes us ask some questions. Okay? This is what theology does. I want to, I want to teach you how to study a verse like this. For God so loved the world, he gave his only Son. Why did he have to do that? Right? That's good theology. We ask questions. We need to ask some questions. God so loved the world, he gave his only son. Why did he do that? Why did he have to do that? Why did he want to do that? What was so bad that he had to send his only son? And mind you, he wasn't sending his son on vacation. He wasn't sending his son to college. He was sending his son to die. It was a kamikaze mission. There was no coming back in, in, light, in, in, in the physical sense. But there was, right? I mean, I'm not signing anybody up for that. I'm not signing my kids up to do that. So why did he have to send his son? I think now we can go back to the beginning of the story. 
Now we can go back to the Garden of Eden where God makes man and woman. He makes Adam and Eve in his image. And after his likeness, he created them. And he says to Adam and Eve, or says to Adam, Eve wasn't created yet. He says to Adam, dude, like be fruitful, multiply, enjoy the earth. Enjoy all of creation. Eat of everything. Eat of all the fruits that I provided for you. But there's this one tree that's mine. There's one thing that's mine. You can have everything, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat it. And just like every single knucklehead kid who gets told not to do something by their parent, that's exactly what he's got to do. He's got to go do that, right? But I want to show you the implications of this. I want to show you some behind-the-scenes actions and, and what's happening here. I want to take you to the letter to the Christian church at Rome, written by the Apostle Paul. And he writes to them in Romans 4.15, and he says, For the law brings wrath. Or the law brings death. But where there is no law, there is no sin. Where there is no law, there is no sin. Okay? So let me demonstrate that for you. You, uh, they, they build a brand new road, and you go on that road, and guess what? You can drive as fast as you want. Because they haven't yet put a speed limit on that road. There's no speed limit on that road, and they haven't put a speed limit sign on that road. But the moment they say this road is a 55 mile an hour road and they put a sign on it, guess what? There's now a law. And when there's law, there's consequence to breaking it. Right? There was no limit, there was no law, so there was no sin. But the moment a rule comes, the moment a command comes, it empowers sin. So, God makes Adam, everything's perfect. There's no sin. Then God says, you can eat everything, but I command you. Watch this, in Genesis 2.16, and the Lord God commanded the man, saying, you may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, do not eat law. It wasn't the Mosaic law, it wasn't the Ten Commandments, but it was a rule. Now, all of a sudden, there's sin. Following me? Okay, now watch. What's the consequence of sin? For in the day that you eat of it, you break this law, you break this rule. In the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. It was an apple. It was an apple or a fig, maybe, like, right? It was a piece of fruit. I'm going to die? I'm going to die? He didn't die from eating a fruit. He died from breaking the law. But where there is no law, there is no sin. You get what I'm saying? Okay, okay. This was not the Mosaic law, but this was an instruction from God. Therefore, anything outside of what God said is now sin. I have a few friends that have joined me today down at PJ Park via video. I want them to demonstrate to you what sin literally is in the Bible. Let's go ahead and watch this on the screen. Hey, Family Church. I'm down here at PJ Park in the pavilion to demonstrate to you kind of what we're talking about in our sermon today. I wanted to do this live on stage, but my lawyer and the insurance company thought it wise not to shoot a compound bow in a room with an audience. So here we are down at PJ Park under the pavilion, and here's the demonstration. I am going to be a non-Christian, a person who does not have a covenant with God. And Pastor John Mark, he is going to be a Christian. And I want to demonstrate to you what sin is. All right, so Pastor John Mark, come on up. Let's demonstrate real quick for what sin is. This is a Christian 
who is going about trying to live his life the right way, live according to the word of God. And he's going to take an attempt at doing something in life. You were shooting at the center uh, target, the center O-ring, and you missed. He tried to shoot that. We're at 20 yards, and he missed the mark. That's the actual Greek word amartio, amartio, to miss the mark. He was trying for the center, and he didn't hit it. All right? Now, as a non-Christian, I want to show you, as a non-Christian, what it's kind of like. Non-Christian, they say, I'm a good person. I do good things. I'm going to take a stab at being a good person. Ready? Watch me here. Ready? I just launched that arrow all the way out to the woods. I couldn't even hit the mark. I couldn't even get close to the mark. I couldn't even hit the target. I'm incapable of coming anywhere near the bullseye or God's perfection. There's another verse in the Bible. It says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In reality, what that verse is literally saying is, it's like me taking this arrow and trying to throw it at the target. Ready? I'm trying my hardest. I'm going to try to get it into that. It fell short. It couldn't even reach the target. There wasn't enough power, enough momentum, enough force behind that arrow to even get it to its target. All have sinned and fall short. All shoot for the mark and miss. All are living life, even aimlessly, non-Christians, living life aimlessly. We are not going to fully hit the bullseye. The bullseye is God's perfection, his perfect design, his perfect will. Now, could we hit the bullseye in different aspects of life? Absolutely. Sure we can. Let's see if Pastor John Mark can shoot one more arrow for me. Let's see how close he can get this time. And he's going to try his hardest to hit that target. To hit that center ring on the target. Ooh, closer, closer, right there, just off the mark. Now it's God sitting back and saying, you dumb idiot, that was horrible. Can't you do any better? Can't you shoot any better? God's not doing that. He's not doing that at all. He says, I know that we're all incapable of hitting the mark, but there is one that can hit the mark every single time his name is Jesus Christ. He sent his son to die on the cross, to live a perfect life, to pay the perfect price that we could live our lives without the fear of consequence from missing the mark. I'm going to turn this back over to Pastor Mike in the main auditorium so he can show you a little bit different drawing up on the screen. You see, I shot my arrow exactly where I was aiming. I was intentionally missing. No, just kidding. The Greek word for sin is that word amart amartia, amartia, A-R-M-T-I-A. It literally means to miss the mark. And I love that verse where it says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And I just, I wanted you to see it a little bit differently. I think that illustration really shows us like, as hard as I could even try to hit that bullseye, and get it stuck in the bullseye, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And God knew this was going to be the case. He knew this was going to be the case. That's why he made a plan of redemption. He made a plan to save us from ourselves, all right? So that's what sin is. But I want to show you, I have a diagram here that I want to show you. We have this non-Christian and the Christian. I was the non-Christian in the demonstration. Pastor John Mark was the Christian. And I want to start over here, right? For a Christian to sin, for a Christian to miss the mark, the penalty is grace. Well, how does that, how does that work? The penalty, right, for the wages of sin is what? Death. For the wages of sin is death. Sin demands death. So, 
as a Christian who, is, who sins, the penalty is death. But whose death? Jesus. Jesus was the death. He was the payment that had to be made for sin. It says that he paid the price for sin in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sin should live under righteousness. That's what the Bible's saying here. Now, for the non-Christian that misses the mark, who lives in sin, there's no safety net. There's no payment. It is their death. It is their spiritual death, and the consequence is hell. For the wages of sin is death. And I don't know what kind of church you've been raised in, but most churches stop right there. For the wages of sin is death. And it scares the tar out of you, and you got to come to the front, you got to cry, right? Got to take communion. (laughs) For the wages of sin is death. But then there's a comma, and then there's three letters. B-U-T. For the wages of sin is death, but... Right? You got to do it like that. You got to understand. For the wages of sin is death. True. True statement. But, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We want to stop here and make everybody feel bad, but we don't ever go over to the free gift of God that's eternal life through Jesus. Let me point this out. Watch this. For the wages what you earned, what you earned, right? You go to work, you earn a wage for your works. You earn it. It's the payment for the wages. The earning of sin is death. That's what you get. This is, what, this is your paycheck. But the free gift, something that I can't earn, I can't earn it. It's free. I can't give a down payment, I can't make a deposit. The free gift of God, and that's literally what grace is. Grace is the unearned, unmerited, undeserved favor of God. It's a free gift of God, eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The payment for sin for a Christian was Jesus' death on the cross. His blood, wash us clean. So the wages of sin is death, yes, it's true. But it is also true that the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We've got to believe that. You've got to walk and live and operate in that freedom and that victory and that knowledge. Grace is engaged when a Christian sins. The actual acts of grace and what it was designed for engages when a Christian sins. Now, we about to start walking on some thin ice. Are you ready? You want to go walk on some thin ice with me? Okay. Let's look back at the letter to the Roman church. This is, Paul, this is Paul's revelation. Paul had like the greatest revelation of Jesus. Romans 5, 18. Therefore, as one trespass led to the condemnation for all men, So that was Adam, Adam's fall, because of one man sin into the world and death by sin, and all have sinned because of Adam. By one man's action, sin came, death came. As so, one act of righteousness, Jesus Christ, leads to justification and life for all men. So death came by one man, and life came by one man. For as by one man's disobedience, Everyone was made sinners. So by one man's obedience, we were all, or the many, were made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass. Whoa, wait a second. The law came in and increased sin. Do we remember back where there is no law, there is no sin? So the law comes and we get like 360-something laws. Think about that. In one day, we go from no law to 360 laws. Where there is no no law, there is no sin. Now there's 360 laws. How much sin is there? How much? Impossible. 
Impossible. I can't remember them all. I can't. Listen, listen. I will almost bet my sneakers. <laughs> almost bet my sneakers. I'm not going to, but almost bet them. That there ain't somebody in here that knows all Ten Commandments in order. And that's just ten. That's just ten commandments, let alone 360 of them. Where there's no law, there's no sin. Now, watch this. So the law came and increased sin. But where sin increased, grace did much more increase. How do we not get it? Right? Grace is exponentially bigger and greater than sin. You can't out sin God's grace. Because where sin increases, grace does much more increase. Watch this. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Where sin abound, grace does much more abound. But Paul knew that we were all a bunch of ratchet people. He knew back then, like right this moment, the question goes through your mind. Well, if we're all covered in grace and more sin is more grace, then why don't I just do whatever I want? Why don't I just sin all I want? <laughs> Pastor Mike, are you saying as a Christian, we can just sin all we want? I'm not saying that the Bible did. I know, I, I, I got you, get quiet. It technically does. But there's a deeper question that we have to ask. Why do you want to? What is it about you that wants to do whatever you want? What is it about you that doesn't want to honor God with your life? What is it about you that doesn't want to honor God with your lifestyle? It's not a problem with God. He dealt with sin. The problem is, why do you still want to do the bad things? Why do you want to do things that hurt yourself? Why do you want to do things that don't align with his glory and his honor and his fame? That's the question that we have to ask. Not if God can forgive us or that I can get away with it. Why do I want to? So... Um, I'm back in college, and I'm really enjoying my time in college, but the thing I like to do the most in college is argue. Oh, I love it. I love arguing. Um, I get in these Zoom calls with my classmates, and they bring up a topic, and I will take uh, a side that I don't even believe in just to argue. <laughs> just to argue with them, and I love it. I get a high off of it. Because uh, <laughs> I love to just see how angry people get trying to defend their faith that they really don't know what they're talking about. And we got on the topic of the nature of God. Can God do anything outside of his nature? Right? And then it got onto the nature of humanity. And this one kid starts going on and on and on. I'm calling him a kid. He's probably 30-something. But he's going on and on about the sin nature. And because we got this sin nature, it just overpowers our, our desires. I said, hey, bro, wait a second. Can I interrupt you? I was like, can you define for me sin nature? And he gave me some abstract, he knows what he's talking about. But let me make it like dumb simple. Sin nature is Satan's nature. Sin nature is Satan's nature. The nature of Satan. Paul said it, the other apostles said it in their writings. They said, you are of your father, the devil. He's been a liar from the beginning and still as Jesus said, I think even as well. Right? So if you have a sin nature... Then you have Satan's nature. And here's what I know. God don't share. I know that about God. Okay? The Bible says that you cannot serve two masters. Where light is, darkness cannot be. Right? So you're either a child of Satan or you're a child of God. So you can't have a sin nature and God's nature at the same time. And the Bible says that at salvation, 
Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new, including my nature. I now have the nature of God. I now have the power of God. I am a child of God. I'm not a child of Satan. So in his little pious, well, then how do you, dis, how do you then say, like, because we keep sinning? Because I got flesh. I'm in a world surrounded by bad internet websites and fast food and movies and people using profanity. Come on, somebody. It don't mean that I have Satan's nature just because I have an appetite of the flesh. All right. Just because you became a Christian, does that mean you no longer like apple pie? Duh. Duh. Eating apple pie didn't change because I became a Christian. My flesh still likes it. But I don't have the nature of Satan. If, all right, now, now you're following me, okay? If I had the nature of Satan, then I had no choice but to sin. In fact, the only sin I'm actually guilty of if I have Satan's nature, is the rejection of Jesus Christ. But I don't have Satan's nature. I have the nature of God, which allows me to stand before him boldly without a sense of guilt or inferiority. And guess what? When I miss the mark, because I'm going to miss the mark, I can still come into his presence and say, oops, I did it again. I did try my best. <laughs> right? It's not my intention. But I messed up. I fell short. I fell short of that perfect mark. All right? So here, Paul says it a little bit more rough. Let's see what Paul says about what I just said. Romans 6 verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin? So that grace may abound, <laughs> right? So if where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. He's like, yo, so should we just like sin a lot to show how great God is? And he says, by no means, that's the ESV in the King James, he says, God forbid. God forbid. And he's speaking strongly here. He goes, listen, I'm telling you how good the grace of God is. I'm telling you what Jesus Christ did for you. Don't use it in vain. Don't, you, don't use it as a license to sin. Don't use it as a license to live a lascivious life. But know that you have been freed from the slavery and the bondage of sin. Walk, therefore, in your new freedom. Right? He says, God forbid, how can we who died to sin still live in it? And, and the, the actual like, description of this is like as a grown adult who knows how to use the potty properly... If you're a grown adult and you've learned how to use the potty, why are you sitting in a dirty diaper? That's the imagery. That's the imagery. He says, that's nasty. Nasty. Watch. Do you not know that all of us have been baptized into Christ Jesus where, where baptism into his death we were buried, therefore, with him by the baptism into death. In order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead, we too might walk in a newness of life. We are empowered to walk in a newness of life. And I'm going to make a turn here. Some things happened to me as a kid growing up that in some areas of my life made me have somewhat of a victim mentality. Like, because of the things that happened to me, that's why I am the way I am today. And until I realized that there's nothing that has power over me to be any other way than what I want to be. Right? So one of them was anger. Bad, bad anger problem. And, and as, as a 
straight abuser, right? Here's an abuser term. Well, if you didn't make me mad, well, if you didn't push my buttons, all right, no one can make you mad and no one can push your buttons. There's no such thing as pushing someone's buttons. It doesn't exist. It, 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 it's an angry person using an excuse to be abusive to somebody. All right? When I realized, when I realized that no one can make me angry, driving on the highway and someone comes off the on-ramp and cuts my car off and I have to hit my brakes, that can't make me angry. That can't make me angry. It can surprise me. It could scare me. It could make me hit my brakes and then like I'm trying to defend my family, but it can't make me angry. Anger, a fit of rage, is a response to a stimuli. And I can choose how I respond to the stimuli. I can choose how I respond. I can choose. What? No, I'm not making that up. The Bible says it. The Bible says I now have a freedom. I'm not a slave to bad behavior. I'm not a slave. I didn't know that. I was blaming everybody for the way I was. I was blaming everybody for the behavior that I had. Blaming this person, that person, the other person. If they didn't do this to me and that didn't happen to me and I didn't get beat up in ninth grade. No. I alone have been empowered by God Almighty to rule and reign my life. My life, my past does not dictate how I have to view today. Come on, somebody. And I'm just saying if there's bad behaviors in your life that you keep excusing because of what's happened to you or the way that you were raised, maybe today's the day to have the freedom. Today's the day to have the freedom. You see, we started in the middle, we looked at why it had to happen, but the finish line is the glory of God. The finish line is a relationship that we get to have with God. That I don't have to be sin conscious, right? That, that, that's what the whole teaching of sin nature is, is that we were sin conscious, so we were living our lives avoiding sin. I don't want to step in sin. I don't want to fall into sin. You've heard people say it. Don't fall into sin. Man, how many of us just jump head first into it like we've done it? But we were so sin conscious, not falling into sin, that we end up going into the thing that we're giving attention to. We got to remove from being sin conscious to save conscious. From sin conscious to saint conscience. I'm a child of God. I have a relationship with Him. And I'm going to go one step further just for one of the major reasons why I see a struggle in us as humans today is that many of us don't have a friend that we trust enough as an escape hatch when we're tempted. We don't have a friend that we can, hey, I'm about to let stupid out the box, let's go bowling. Let's go shoot guns, get me out of the house. Right, we all had this macho, secret, cover up, nah, I'm good, nah, I'm good, I'm good. And our friend says, hey man, how you doing? Nah, I'm good, but you're dying inside. Nah, I'm good, but you're struggling with temptation. Nah, I'm good. And you got all these things inside you that you're like, if someone could just see me and talk to me, I need some freedom. I'm telling you, the church would be a healthy place. But we're so afraid of the condemnation that's not of God. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn you but to set you free. Set you free from the thing that has been weighing you down and holding you back. Father, we come to the name of Jesus today. And Lord, I pray that there would be freedom here. That there would be healing here. That as far as the east is from the west, you have separated us from our sin. You remember it no more. Help us to walk in the freedom of a relationship with you. Holy Spirit, 
bring to our knowledge the things that are off track or not right. And in love, correct us and guide us back on the right path. Lord, help us to love you with our actions. Love you with our decisions. Love you with our dreams and our desires. Help us to be more like you. Help us to focus less on avoiding to do wrong and help us just to put our eyes on you. And by doing that, you will never lead us to wrong. You will lead us into all truth. You will lead us by still waters. Lord, I thank you today that your word is alive. It's powerful. It's sharp for the need to it. It's speaking life to our hearts and to our spirits right now. Lord, that person who, who in their life they have been abused and someone took advantage over their body, I pray right now that there's healing over their mind and healing over their soul in the name of Jesus. That they would not be a repeater of the things that happened to them, God. They'd be free from that in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray to those who have been hurt relationally, they've been hurt financially, that, Lord, the joy of the Lord could be their strength again. I thank you, Lord, that the peace of God would reign richly in our hearts and our minds. Be the healer. Be the healer. Lord, I pray freedom right now in the name of Jesus. Freedom from pain. Freedom from hurt. Freedom from anger. God, we do not have to be controlled by anger. Freedom from anger. Bring us our laugh back. Bring joy into our homes. Let the laughs of our children bring joy and not anger. I pray for vision for our futures. Vision for our homes in the name of Jesus. Visions for ways to advance the kingdom of God that honors you, Lord. If you're here today and you've never had an opportunity to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, to step into this freedom, to step into this promise of eternal life, I'd love to offer that to you today. And we do it by praying what's called the prayer of salvation. It's a confession of our faith. And we love you so much that we want to just say it out loud with you. And that prayer goes, dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you for watching today's message. My name is Ashley, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. First, we want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is take a next step on your journey, and we would love to help you do that. You can head on over to familychurchny.com or email us at team at to get started today.